It's that time of the week where Yaffe talks with an expert that is a voice of reason in a world that is beyond reason. This is the Beyond Reason Radio Interview of the Week. Welcome, everybody, to uh, Beyond Reason Radio's Interview of the Week. And uh, this week, I am talking with Francis Rooney, who is the former U.S. ambassador to the Holy See, which, of the, for those who don't know, it's the Catholic Church. He was the ambassador under George W. Bush. Um, he joins me today. How are you today, sir? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I am doing good, although when I read your article, you wrote an article recently in thehill.com about ISIS, and I, I read that, and obviously it concerns me what's going on with ISIS, and it seems like at least we're not really doing enough about it if we're doing anything at all about it. Um, but first I wanted to ask you, tell me why is why should we be afraid of ISIS? Well, I think they're violent, violent criminals who are waging war on the Western world and on basically our entire civilization, as well as persecuting Christians that live in the countries where they operate and and basically trying to turn Iraq and Syria into, or probably Libya as well, into some kind of medieval theocracy. Right. And um, and when you say persecuting Christians, they're literally crucifying them, am I correct on that? Well, at least beheading. I haven't heard of any crucifying, but I've heard of a lot of beheadings and, and shootings and, and bombings. Bombers. And um, so if, I, if I'm if i someone in the United States, obviously I feel bad for what's going on overseas with ISIS against Christians. And as a Christian, I feel like we should stand up for that. But there might be some out there who say, well, that's just the Middle East problem. We need to stay out of the Middle East and they won't bother us. What, what would you well, tell, are, tell people like that? Well, those are some of the themes that we're raising last night's debate. And I think exactly, yes. Bush said it, said it very well, that the United States has to lead in the world. And if we don't lead, uh, the bad state actors will come in and fill the void. doesn't necessarily mean it's always with troops, but we have to exercise strong foreign policy leadership. I, I thought the governor hit the nail on the head there. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's funny when you think about it with uh, – What's going on in Europe right now? Europe basically tried to get out of the Middle East and ignore the Middle East, and now they're dealing with this huge refugee problem that's affecting them right at home. And a lot of that is because of what went on with ISIS. Am I right on that? Well, I think it is in large part. Europe's uh, lack of principle and and secularism has gotten them into a a pretty tough spot right now because the Mm -hmm. Schengen visa program provides that if you get into the EU, you can go anywhere in the EU. And now you're seeing uh, Hungary, Poland, even the UK, as late as this morning, push back on that, saying we want to know who's coming into our country because we don't want uh, so many of these refugees, and we certainly don't want any bad guys. And there's bound to be a significant number of radicalized people mixing into some of these refugees. Yeah, and and how would you vet that? I, I can't imagine there is any good way to vet to be able to vet properly everyone that's coming in, all those refugees that are coming in, and to say, okay, they're not, they're not from ISIS. They've never been with ISIS, so we'll just let them in. I can't imagine that could be a smart move. Uh, no, it, it, it takes a real process. You know, there is a procedure for uh, theoretically vetting people and determining whether they are genuine merit, genuinely merit asylum or not. But with the, these volumes and. And with the uh, and, and the countries where that procedure is supposed to take place, like Greece, uh, very difficult to 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 be assured that a proper vetting has been held and that people coming into these countries are uh, non-radicalized and actually capable of being productive citizens. My understanding, many of these refugees are illiterate, can't work, uh, especially the ones from Africa, diseased. It's a real problem for Europe that they're going to have to deal with. Right. And it's obviously going to be a problem for the United States as well. So here is the main question, then. What do we do? How do we fight ISIS? Because obviously they're a very hard enemy to find sometimes and pinpoint because they can pop up anywhere. So how do we fight them? Well, well, the first thing is I think you, you have to understand the limits of American power in that part of the world and tailor, tailor our responses to doing what we can do and not doing things that are going to lead us down another blind path. 
And that, that was evident last night during the debate as well. There were some people that said, don't do anything, like Rand Paul. There were some people that said, go in there and take everybody out in a highly militaristic view of using troops. And then you had Governor Bush saying, we've got to lead, but we've got to figure out how we lead and what effective leadership can be. One thing we can do is we can establish the no-fly zone in northern Syria, where, whereby the refugees will have a place to stay and not emigrate. And we'll buy ourselves a little room between Turkey and Syria. You know, Turkey's been overwhelmed by over 2 million refugees. And that will perhaps enable us to get Turkey to harden up their border and not let anyone else go in there. Uh, if we could accomplish that and harden up the border on the west with Jordan and the south with Saudi Arabia, it would be easier to contain the, contain the threat. doesn't mean the threat that doesn't have to be eliminated, but we could at least contain it. And it would make life more difficult on them. You know, th those places are, are, uh, are not very agricultural. They're very dry. And I think if we could put enough of a ring fence around them, it would make life very difficult inside the so-called caliphate. Now, um, it was also raised in the debate, though, because the no-fly zone was brought up by people like Jeb Bush, like you said. But some other people were concerned about that because do we just tell Russia that they can't, they can't fly there? Um, how would that work with Russia? Or maybe would we partner with them? How, how would we get well, past it, that? It, Go ahead. You know, the, the years of weakness of the Obama administration, which have enabled and emboldened Vladimir Putin to do some pretty outrageous things, like take Crimea back, like take the eastern half of the Ukraine, yep. and now to, to uh, go into Syria, I think um, um, put us back in more of a Cold War posture. So I think you can establish a, a no-fly no zone. And you can patrol it just like we used to patrol vis-a-vis -vis the, the Russians during the Cold War. It could very well be that someone gets shot down, you know, just like Gary Powers in the U2. I think we're almost back to 1954 here. We it need sure a policy seems like of it. containment and, 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 and confrontation. So you would actually say, okay, you would tell Russia, hey, we're going to do a no-fly zone here. That means your planes as well. And if they are flying over Syria, they will get shot down. Well, there's a couple of ways to do that. First of all, you definitely want to try to get the Russians on board. You do everything you can do diplomatically right. to do that. The next thing you do is you establish all kinds of protocols to, to, to maximize evasive tactics and minimize the chance of an actual uh, shooting in the air. Right. And then I guess the third thing you do is the American people, through their elected officials, are going to have to decide, do they want to carve Russia out of that no-fly zone and limit that no-fly zone to uh, direct combatants? Those are all levels of engagement that could be deployed. Right. All right. And, um, and speaking of other ways to contain ISIS, you had mentioned before that we need to contain them maybe in that part of the world. Another way to fight them, you, you have said in your articles in, in the past, is through the Catholic Church, through the Holy See, or through the church in general. Uh, what exactly did you mean by that? How could, say, the Catholic Church as a whole fight ISIS? Well, I, the, 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 the central point there is that religion has a strong role to play in how the world deals philosophically and diplomatically with a religiously clothed dispute. And the Catholic Church is the most organized of any of those religions. And I use that example of when Truman, President Truman, tried to get all the religions together to battle communism. And the only one that was capable of mounting an effective and cogent response was the Catholic Church because two things. One, they have the hierarchy which means they can get out a message around the world. And they'll have to consult, you know, tons of different patriarchs and bishops over its wording. And then the other thing is that they were the first to realize the existential threat which communism poses to all religion. So they had a pretty visceral response. The other religions were a little more nuanced, and some of them were either more somewhat of uh, acceptance of communistic uh, and socialistic uh, uh, things back in, the, back in the 50s. But neither here nor there, it's a war. George Bush called it a war. Obama won't call it a war. And it's Islamic terror. George Bush called it Islamic terror. Uh, Obama won't call it that. They try to deprecate it into being some type of police action against criminals. And I think we need to re reopen that debate for what the, about what this really is and therefore galvanize the people to be willing to back our elected officials in trying to uh, oppose it, much along the lines of what Governor Bush said last night. So it sounds like what you're saying is the church could get involved with that galvanization process where they could say, look, this is more than just an, a regular army we're fighting, more than just an enemy. This is a religious battle. And we as Christians or we as the Catholic Church, for example, have to have to understand that and use that 
to pressure our politicians. Am I kind of getting to your point there? Yeah, I mean, take what Pope Benedict said back at Regensburg in 2006. It still resonates today, and Pope Francis continued to echo the same theme. As he said, a couple of things. He said, first of all, the world is going to have to unite to, to somehow help and require, but hopefully help, Islam come to terms with its Quranic teachings, which are not consistent with the way life is led in the 21st century, with the respect for life, with the tolerance, uh, with respect for women and children, the avoidance of slavery, uh, those, those principles that, that have no place in 21st century life but are really nurtured by the Quran, well, they're going to have to come to terms with that. So on the one hand, religions have a role to play using their convening power, bringing other religions together with Muslims and talking about how this might take place, as well as uh, having the moral standing as a religion and not a secular state to call on their other religious uh, faith traditions, Muslims, to say, you all need to take responsibility for your religion. Just like in the 12th century, in the, the Reformation, the Counter-Reformation, the Catholic Church had to take responsibility for its. Right. And, uh, and there's definitely a precedent in history for this, because we did that exact same thing to defeat the Soviet Union in the Cold War. We had to, am I right on that? We had to call the Catholic Church and have the Catholic Church help us galvanize people against them for the same almost similar reasons that what they are promoting is anti-religion it's against our religion and our values yes it's totally contrary to humanity and and that's exactly the role that the holy see played in the cold war both in the as you read in the book about the uh formation of the christian democratic party in italy as right. well as uh supporting cardinal mazinski and, and hungary all those years and and uh they've got a strong role to play but this is a this is a global menace, and it's almost a, war, a culture war in many ways. And uh, when you see young people that have become radicalized from Europe and the United States to go fight for these thugs, you've got to really wonder about some of the other methods that might be taken to reduce radicalization. I know that Spain and France – which do not have a Fourth Amendment, by the way, uh, have undertaken measures to, to track people that go on radicalizing websites. Now, that's a pretty serious infringement of privacy that I don't think would perhaps be something the United States culture would go for. But, but it clearly, shows they're say, taking it seriously. Yeah, and there's clearly a series of very radical, very radical imams around the United States, and we know who they are, and they're public, and, and maybe a little higher scrutiny of the kind of people that go to them would be appropriate and consistent with the Fourth Amendment because they're putting themselves in the place of being radicalized. Interesting. Okay, one last question that I have for you, and this is this is a hard question to answer. Can ISIS be defeated? Do you believe that ISIS can be defeated, eradicated? And, well, not just ISIS, but Islamic extremism as a whole. Oh, yeah. I think absolutely it will ultimately be defeated or mutate into something that's consistent with modern life. It's just a question of how many people have to die in the process and how long will it take. Wow. I mean, it took, it took Catholics a pretty good while. Oh, that's true. And, you know, a lot of people didn't think that communism, Soviet Union, could ever be defeated, and they were. So and yeah. it, took, it took true leadership and, to say that it could. Also, there's also the collateral question of who will defeat it. And, you know, we're still the greatest country there is. We still have the greatest economic engine. We still have more freedom, and we, and we still have a higher level of religiosity than most countries. But there are trends in the United States that are not so great either, and some of that was talked about in the debates too. We need to control our spending. We need to uh, confront some of the demographic changes that are affecting that spending in the United States. And we need to speak with a clear voice uh, on behalf of the, both the next generation of Americans and in terms of how we're going to confront these threats around the world. Yeah, Rubio had said that we don't have an economy without national security, but we also don't have national security without an economy. So it does go both ways, right as, right as you're saying. All right, Ambassador. Well, remember, at the end of the day, yeah, but, it was our economic clout that took the Soviet Union down. That, that's true. That's true. Yeah, we Reagan spent them to death. Yeah, and um, there, yeah, there's a chance that we could do that again. We were, <laughs> we were almost defeating Iran economically until uh, – the recent <laughs> nuclear deal, but until the terrible agreement with right. a Rue ever happened. <laughs> yeah, I, I could not agree more with that. All right, Ambassador Rooney, I appreciate you uh, coming on with us, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll talk again soon. 
Okay, I appreciate being on. I hope you have a nice day. All right, thank you. And make sure to check out Ambassador Francis Rooney's book, The Global Vatican, which is available at Amazon.com.